Well, good evening and welcome to The Delights of Gardening and Creating Backyard Habitat. I'm Dorothy Stoltz with Carroll County Public Library. And tonight's program is sponsored by Maryland Humanities and hosted by Carroll County Public Library. Tonight we are uh, uh, joining up with the One Maryland, One Book, an initiative by Maryland Humanities. And the theme for this year's One Maryland, One Book is hope. The book selection is The Book of Delights by Ross Gay. And it is a collection of lyrical essays. Gay wrote one essay per day over a tumultuous year and took the time to find delights in his everyday life. The essays range from a topic of beauties in nature, which is our topic for tonight, uh, to what it is to be a black man in America. And readers can look to Gay's collection as a guide to finding their own daily delights. Uh, I'd like to give special thanks to Carroll Citizens for Racial Equality, the Carroll County Arts Council, and the NAACP Carroll County Chapter uh, for joining us in uh, collaboration and partnership tonight. So once again, uh, we're so glad you're here. We have uh, three um, gardening and uh, backyard habitat uh, experts, Steve Algar, Ross Fernero, and Andrea Kololeski. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and we're gonna get started with Steve. Great, thank you, uh, Dorothy. Um, I just wanted to, uh, as I pull up my slides, uh, let's see how I do this, there we go. Um, just tell you a little bit about myself. I um, worked for University of Maryland Extension in Carroll County, here in Carroll County for ooh, probably 18 to 20 years. And I had, I, I helped to run the Master Gardener program. And also I was a horticultural assistant who helped people with their kind of lawn garden tree questions for those 18 to 20 years. And Andrea actually was one of my early Master Gardeners. Um, and she's going to be full of knowledge. Um, I'm going to be sharing tonight uh, or talking about native trees and shrubs um, in the landscape. And a lot of these plants are plants I consider little used or underused um, or just personal favorites that I think everybody should probably try and work into their landscape. Um, and, and at the end of my presentation, hopefully there'll be some questions or comments. Um, is, are my slides up? Yes. Great, great. Okay, well, the first um, tree that I'm going to start with is, and, and a lot of these trees and shrubs could arguably, arguably be one or the other. Um, some people will say, oh, that's more of a shrub and not a tree. But this, starting with the Carpinus or American hornbeam, is, um, is a great native Maryland tree that probably gets about 20 to 30 foot tall and wide. And I don't see it used enough in a landscape. And I, I understand why it, it doesn't get covered with blooms in the spring at, at all. You, you never see blooms on it. But for its structure and its benefits for wildlife, I think it's one of these trees that people should include in their landscape. It naturally grows on typically um, wooded hillsides down low, maybe close to the streams. Um, it's also called muscle wood, and we'll have a close up on another slide showing the, uh, the bark, but it's truly a four season tree. Um, it has that interesting structure in the winter with that muscular looking bark, and then this light green leaves that, that come out in the spring. And through the summer, it's great habitat for for birds, especially birds that are trying to escape some sort of predator because it has that dense low crown. Um, and as you can see, the fall color, the top picture on the left, um, it, it varies, but typically you get this russeted yellow and red. And it, the name hop hornbeam comes from those cones that are hanging down. That's the seeds or the samaras like maples have that drop off and of course bring on the next generation. 
And the bottom picture on the left is a picture, of course, of the bark, and you can see that sinewy, muscular look. Um, traditionally, this was a very um, hard, well, it's a, it's a hard wood, and it was used a lot for handles of mallets and sledges and hammers. It was just considered very durable. Um, I've tried working with a knife, and it is very hard wood. Um, the next tree or shrub, this probably is closer to a shrub, is called a, a fringe tree. And it's, um, it's, as you can see from this in the spring, late spring, it has, it's covered in these white tassel-like blooms. Um, many people have seen this, and in actuality, they've seen the kissing cousin, which is called Kyananthus retusus. And that's a, um, a Russian or Asian fringe tree. Um, our native, I think, is just as pretty. The leaves aren't quite as thick, but if you get a male, and this is one of these plants like a holly where you have a male and a female, the, the male has more flowers than the female. Um, however, a lot of people like to have a female tree because they get this kind of unusual blue-black droop or fruit that hangs starting in July and it persists through the winter until birds or wildlife seem to take it. Um, I see this in our woodlands, but not often. So it is, it is native to Maryland. I've seen it in low wet spots. I was in a woodland that was probably considered a forested wetland. And then I was in some woods in Leakin Park and it was way up on a rocky hillside. Um, it's usually found in the understory, but if you drag it out of the understory and you plant it in the open, you'll get this beautiful yellow fall color um, that the, that's shown in the picture on the right. So Kynanthus or fringe tree is a great addition for a landscape um, and not commonly found. This is a bit more common. It's called Sweet Bay Magnolia or Magnolia virginiana or virginiana, depending on how you pronounce it. It's usually multiple stems like this picture showing on the left. I've seen this in swamps. I've seen it as tall as 30 foot um, to 35 foot with kind of big trunks, about 12 inch across at chest height. The real beauty of this isn't just in its appearance, but in the smell. And you can clip off those flowers and put them in a very short little dish with water, and it will provide fragrance for days um, until the flower fades. And it kind of has a thick leathery leaf, um, but it is not evergreen like the, the larger leaf evergreen magnolias. It will eventually lose its leaves in the winter. But you do get this pretty fruit. You can see that that one picture has a great display of the red berries. And some people cut them for displays. They aren't quite as large or as showy as the, um, the evergreen uh, magnolia, but um, that's not as easy to grow here either. You can stick this in a wet spot or in a, or in a relatively um, moderate moisture area in a garden or a landscape, and it works quite, quite, quite well. Um, the leaves are light colored on the bottom um, and kind of a dark, glossy green on top. Um, one of my favorites, and it's everywhere in our woods, is called Lindera benzoin or spice bush. The beauty of this is deer leave it alone. <laughs> so if you have problems with deer, they tend to leave it alone. It doesn't look like much in the woods, but I think if you drag it out of the woods, it's, uh, it's a, a real gem for any landscape. It has these small greenish yellow blooms. That's what's dotting the picture on the left that run up and down the stems and they're quite fragrant. And I think deer and other herbivores leave it alone because if you crunch the leaves, and this is one way of identifying it, it has a very rich spicy smell to the, the crushed leaf or stem. Um, and it also is, it, unfortunately you see it in the shade and it doesn't look like much, but when you pull it out in the fall, you tend to get this nice yellow co color all over. Now, if you want to turn something like this, which is kind of shrubby and open into more of a tree, you just need to start pruning it. It won't mind, it keeps growing. And what I mean by pruning is you prune out some of the, the stems that are down low and you slowly elevate the plant by cutting off the lower branches that come off the stems that you leave till you get it to the height that you like. And periodically, you'll just go through and maintain that, that tree-like look by trimming out anything that comes up from the base. Um, 
Oh, a true, a true friend in our household is the um, blueberry bush or high bush blueberry, Vicinium cornbosum. Um, great workhorse because birds love it. I love it. And I do battle with the birds because they're taking all the fruit, especially those darn cat birds. Um, I, it, most people say it needs periodic pruning. I just prune it so I can get in there to pick the berries before the birds do. It's not going to be a front yard plant in the sense if you have a manicured front because it's a bit open like some of these other plants that I'm talking about, but it's great in a side yard or a backyard. And I like the fall color, the reds and the leaves. And this is a plant, I don't know why, but I haven't seen much evidence of deer browse. I know rabbits like it, but once it gets high enough, the rabbits really can't reach the fruit bearing parts of the plant. So you should be pretty safe that way. Um, just some more pretty pictures of blueberries. Actually, this bottom right is the, well, it was <laughs> one that I found in a swamp somewhere. Um, by far, this is probably my favorite plant. Um, it's, it's more of a shrub. It's called Viburnum prunifolium or black hall viburnum. And as you can see by the picture on the left, it's fall color and it has that russeted fall look. This is a great um, plant for wildlife, especially birds. That black seed-like droop um, or dark blue fruit or droop is high in fat and birds love to eat it because of that, that high fat value. The other thing is it's great protection from birds prey. The small birds can fly into this relatively dense shrub um, and have good protection from the, the other animals that may be trying to pick it off. I like taking these plants and, pr and pruning up the bottom and turning it into a tree. It has nice looking bark, which I don't think I have a picture of, um, but you can create a, a tree that's about 12 to 18 foot tall, as long as you groom up or remove some of those bottom branches and create a tree structure rather than a shrub structure. Again, it has that good fall color, very, very reliable. And this new kind of um, leaf beetle called a viburnum leaf beetle doesn't seem to pick on this particular viburnum. It is a native, it can grow in a wetland, it can grow in a hillside, but if you put it in the sun, you tend to get better color and you also get good looking blossoms, which I don't think I have a picture of. No, I don't. So I'm done. <laughs> Any questions from anybody or comments? I. We don't have any uh, questions, uh, but I, I was curious about um, establishing either a backyard habitat. Is there like a, a formal way to know if you have all the elements or a wildlife habitat in your I'm in your that one, Andrea, for later, but for me, it's watching to see what comes in and how many critters are, are feeding or showing up at different times of the day. So there, there probably is a formula, I'm not aware of it. I know I try, my, my job now is I go out and we do environmental assessments of large woodlands. And what we look for are especially all the components of a healthy woodland, which means an overstory and understory and ground vegetation. And in that ground vegetation, hopefully we're seeing successors, meaning other small tree seedlings that are coming in to take over the um, canopy, because we all know that the forest is probably the most important thing here in Maryland. I'm partial to forest. <laughs> As you should be, yes. Yes, yes, of course. Well, um, I think we can go on to part two, if you want to introduce uh, Ross. Okay, we have Ross here, and Ross works for Natural Lawn, right? And he um, is going to actually be talking about what are features and lawn care, I believe. So I'm going to let Ross fill in all the gaps that I left out. Hi, everybody. I am Ross Fenero, the Steve said. Thank you. I um, work at Natural Lawn of America. I've been there with this company for about 30 years, where I was also had the opportunity to um, run a company, a water garden company called uh, Living Waters Ornamental Ponds and Streams. So we have since um, dis dismantled that company to concentrate on lawn care. Um, so, but we've, you know, I probably did that for about 10 years. So 
as it relates to Ross Gay's book, um, The Study of Delight, is what I had in my first slide here. He was talking about, you know, the more you, you know, you kind of exercise that delight muscle or, or you know, your delight radar, the more delight you, you study, the more delight you have to study kind of thing. So the, the power of positive thinking, basically. So you can go to the next slide. So, and of course, like Steve said, you know, my presentations on both water and grass in the landscape. So start off with water, um, the benefits of the water features in the landscape. And, you know, it's whether you're standing on the edge of the ocean or standing next to a babbling brook, um, everybody likes water. So it's a good source for animals and beneficial insects. Um, the simple sight and sound of moving water is relaxing. And it's a, another place to give us, you know, to plant unique plants to another another uh, area, you know, to give us opportunity for that. So we can go into the types of water features. So it kind of starts out from very small to very large. So um, bird baths, self-contained fountains kind of fit anywhere. Bubbling rocks and urns have become very popular. Um, natural looking water features, um, landscape ponds. We built a lot of those with living waters, ponds and streams. Um, formal ponds and reflecting pools. Koi ponds and swimming ponds are kind of a newer upcoming thing. So you kind of have to decide what you want. Um, very simple, you know, it seems to be. Um, the level of maintenance that you want to do um, in Ross's book, his essay number two is talking about time spent in the garden. Is it really spent kind of thing? Um, you just got to think about that. What are you willing to do as a homeowner or, you know, a, a caretaker? Um, what kind of space that you have available for water and uh, what style fits best with your taste. If you have a very natural setting then a natural, you know, water feature, or if it's very formal, then you're going to go with more formal stuff. Um, if you're going to house fish, um, you got to worry about predators and such. So um, you got to think about that too. So bird baths and self-contained fountains, everybody's probably seen them and use those are pretty simple. Um, it gives you opportunity to get into water features, um, easy to maintain. Do have to clean them out um, weekly by scrubbing them. Just dumping them doesn't usually work. The and mosquito eggs can can still stick on the sides there, and you got a lot of styles and stuff to, to you know fit any kind of um, landscape that you have there. Of course, it's going to attract birds and and other critters to your landscape. So the next step up probably would be bubbling rocks and urns. So usually that's a more permanent feature. You're going to have to figure out getting electricity to them. Um, you'll have, you know, it's very natural with the bubbling rock, you know, kind of thing. That's what I have in my front yard at the moment. Some of the urns are a little bit more formal type thing, but you can have that sound of water. The real low maintenance, um, basically you can turn them off and blow them out with leaf blower, maybe once a year, clean the basin with a shop vac, something like that. So pretty low maintenance features, um, they fit just about anywhere. And then you got the natural looking pond. Um, everybody kind of wants that, it seems like. Um, it can be sized to fit your landscape. We built very large ones to very small ones. Um, it can house fish. Um, it'll attract wildlife from birds to, you know, everything comes to your pond. Um, and if it's properly designed, it can be relatively low maintenance. So maybe a, a yearly clean out, we drain it, power wash it, you know, and that sort of thing. But if it's if it's well done, um, it can be really low maintenance throughout the year. Um, you may need to control predators if you have the, the fish there for your family and such. They tend to get named and you don't want, um, you know, little Su Susie Q's fish being flown away by blue herring. So, uh, need probably some predator control for fish situations. Get the next slide. There we go. Formal pond and reflecting pools. Um, of course, it's going to be in more of a formal garden setting. Um, still going to be good for wildlife, dragonflies. You can house fish in them usually. Um, maintenance can vary depending on, you know, how it's designed basically and where it is. 
Um, of course, that's, you know, this in the pond, this picture has got a tree overhanging, so you're going to get some more leaves in it and such. Um, but it can all be dealt with seasonally. You can add different things to it if it's, you know, to a little bit more flair for, you know, fountains and lights um, can change the whole look of it. And then they have a koi pond, which is, that can be a natural looking pond. It can have a formal look to it, but you got to really think about the, the, how it's made. Um, is your, you got like a living creature there, usually a higher fish load, which means higher number of fish, because once you start collecting koi, you don't stop. It's addictive. Um, so you have to really, you're, you're keeping a pet. So you're, you know, monitoring the water. Um, predator, predator control is absolute because these fish can be very expensive. Um, you don't want a $10,000 fish flying away under a bird. And then um, swimming ponds are up and coming kind of. Um, really got to think about engineering those um, basically for safety. Um, external pumps would be involved here instead of internal pumps for electricity problems, you know, as far as people swimming in them. You got to check your local codes. Um, usually a fence is not required for these. This pond in particular, um, that's kind of a before and after picture of, of what was there. And then, you know, now there's a pond and such there. Um, that's nine feet deep at the deepest end where you, where you can dive into that pond. It's pretty, pretty cool. So, yeah, there's many choices. Um, incorporate water into your landscape. You can go very large scale or very small to, you know, a fountain, such things. This is this is quite a unique pond that actually runs underneath their house. Um, they designed their, their house in this mine that we built the pond for them. So if anybody's got any questions. All right, so we got a question here. Um, I think the the uh, question is, um, uh, what kind of uh, planning and design time is involved to uh, help with really getting at your the water um, design that you want? So usually when I would go to a home, um, I would start inside the house because people don't think about that. They have a hill somewhere or something like that. They're kind of envisioning um, this water feature. But if, if you can see it from inside your home, you get a lot more use out of it. So usually I would start inside the house and look out your windows and find the spot and then work with that spot. Um, so that's generally how I would start and just try to match it to budget and match it to your to your landscape. Like any garden, you tend to change it and make it bigger. Um, so try to start out a little bit larger than you think. Um, that way you don't have to, you can grow into it a little bit. Great, thank you. And I think uh, uh, Steve has a question here. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, I know a lot of people worry about mosquitoes when they have mm -hmm. water features, and you mentioned dumping out the water, but obviously some of those things you don't want to dump out because it's several yeah. thousand gallons. How, yeah. what, what are some of the strategies for managing uh, those critters because they aren't anybody's favorite that I know of? Yeah, exactly. Well, we found uh, with a lot of the, the natural water features and the moving water, you never really had an issue with it. Yeah. And you're actually the dragonflies and the beneficial insects in the water do a lot of good control on that. The fish cool. don't eat them. People think the fish eat them and such, but they don't eat them. Um, but it's actually the dragonflies and the dragonfly larvae within the water that really do a good job controlling mosquitoes. We never had an issue with it. I had a large pond in my front yard and never had an issue with mosquitoes. Oh, so that's it, good news. It, it works as a good, you know, it's moving, the water's clean, you know, so actually the bird baths cause more mosquitoes than than the larger features because they're not really an ecosystem. Yeah, so, that's true. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Yep. All right. So if there's no more questions, we'll move on to the next. Um, so grass, the benefits of turf in the landscape. So I know I know turf and lawns are a little controversial nowadays. Um, but 
And so, it, you know, we'll go into this. And of course, it's pleasing the eye if they're if it's well maintained, um, or even if it's a flowing meadow look, um, that can look really uh, you know appealing um, in the in the right area. So, um, you know, of course, turf helps reduce erosion. It's effective air and water filter. It actually collects a, a ton of dust, which is kind of weird to think of, but it does act like a, a good dust filter. Um, and we can walk on it. So that's where it differs from some of the perennial planting. So you can use the turf, you know, have ter good turf in areas where you're going to travel to visit your gardens throughout the landscape. Um, it does have a cooling effect. Um, you know, mulch will actually heat up more than turf will. And then the turf actually transferring its, you know, water will actually help cool the landscape also. So kind of brought in talk about organic um, lawn care and it's some kind of there's some misconceptions a little bit when somebody hires a lawn care company um, what the organic program is true organic fertilizer is derived directly from plants animals um, such as bone meals manure and, and compost some um, there's biosolids and stuff like that also um, but generally organic lawn care programs that are commercially offered, um, it just, it kind of means that you're not getting synthetic weed controls or insect controls, but there might be synthetic fertilizer in there. Organic based lawn care is basically what we do at Natural Lawn. Um, that, that's what we started over, it's I think it was, we had a 34 year anniversary um, just the other day. Um, it's kind of a mix of all that and using an IPM approach to control insects and weeds. Um, so it's kind of a best of both worlds, best, best of both worlds type thing. So just like the water features, you got to figure out what you want. Um, what are you going for? Um, do you want that an area of manicured formal look or do you want it to be kind of that free spirited um, environment? Of, of meadow or or a, a shady forest um you know, like the one picture in the bottom right corner you know that's a that's a pretty shady lawn to have a lot of turf like that and and the biggest maintenance there is the mowing practices um and yeah so it's kind of what the what the environment is um and then and what you want to do with it so a lot of times people make a lawn and then decide where they're going to put their flower beds so the, the lawn actually stabilizes the area until you figure out what else you want there. So important cultural practices. Um, so, you know, of course I work at a lawn care company, um, but I'm a very small part of what actually goes on on that turf. Um, so we always call it the three-legged stool. So we're only part of it. And you got mother nature, you got the customer, and, and then you got us, you know, doing our input. Um, but the most important cultural practices are the mowing, watering. Um, you can aerate and seed and regular aeration. And then, of course, feeding and soil amending to change that soil. And then putting the turf in the right place. Just like any other landscape, you want the right, plate, right plant in the right place. So mowing is the most important thing. Um, and generally, we don't mow. And so we don't have much control over it. But we try to educate people on this. So this is the biggest thing you can do for your lawn is keep the turf mowed tall. Three and a half inches generally is in our area. That's what you're going for. Um, and you want to take off, when you mow, you don't want to take off any more than a third of the leaf blade. So that doesn't, when you do that, when you cut off a third of the leaf plant, of the blade of the plant, you're not shocking that plant. It doesn't have to recoup itself and take its carbohydrates from its root system. So you're, so just a trim is so important. Um, and again, keep it cut tall and with sharp blades. And sharp blades are going to kind of help you down the road with disease problems and such. And it helps the plant recover quicker. And of course, return to clippings. Because when you return to clippings, you're adding the nutrients that that plant's losing right back into the soil. Clippings don't add to the thatch at all. People think that clippings will build up thatch, but they don't. Um, so you want to return the clippings back to each with each mowing. So watering... So generally a turf stand that is maintained well 
doesn't need much watering. It doesn't need any watering, really. It'll survive. Um, it'll take drought very well. It'll go dormant. It'll shut itself down. Um, so kind of the over, people think they need to water their lawn, but it's not really that true. Um, at the bottom there, it's, you know, if maybe if you did seeding, you would need to water. So you want to try to water in the mornings um, before 11 o'clock. And that'll reduce the chance of any kind of um, disease problems throughout the night. People think you would water at night so the water can sit there. The plant can take in the water, um, but that's not true. Um, the plant will take in the water just fine, you know, once it gets to the root system. So, uh, yeah, you want to water early. And then you want to water deep. Um, it, it's better to water, like, you know, every, if you're going to water, um, water once a week instead of every day. So you want the water to get into the soil, travel through the soil, and have the roots chase the water. You don't want your 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 grass to be shallow rooted. So it's you know if in, in those times that you feel like you need the water, water infrequently, but but longer time periods. And it's kind of hard to tell how much how long that is because you don't know what the water um, rate is on the site. But generally, that's what we what we go by. So and then of course if you do seeding, you have to water. So aeration and seeding. Um, aeration is one of the best things, you know, beside mowing. So aeration is actually generally core aeration is pulling a plug out of the soil. What that does is allows moisture and nutrients to get down to the root system, air down to the root system because the roots do need air. Um, and it puts that plug up on top. And that plug, if, if the lawn is healthy, that plug is filled with a bunch of microbes. And those microbes will actually help break down any kind of thatch issues you have. So you're punching holes in the thatch and you're actually top dressing with the, you know, the native soil there. So it's a, it's a pretty important process. Generally that's done in the fall. And then seeding can also be done at that time. And seeding gives you the advantage of actually, actually adding new plants to the turf. Um, you know, you can look at a lawn as a monoculture, but it's actually made up of all different varieties of, of turf types. Generally, that's what you want to go for. Just like in the landscape, you want you wouldn't want the landscape to be one type of plant because if something happens, insect or disease, you're going to lose your whole landscape. Lawn is a very similar thing. Um, and of course, you know, thickening the lawn is the best, you know, weed control there is. The, the, the less holes and less bare spots, um, the less weed you have. And you can go around and touch up spots with a garden weasel also. So that brings us to the feeding and soil amendments. The soil test is the important thing to do. Um, we do soil tests every three years. Generally, that's you can do it every year for your site. Um, either way, it's the, your instructions, basically, what you need to do. So um, our philosophy is to do a little bit each time. So some people say, let's, you know, just, just fertilize in the fall. Um, and you know, guidelines are, you know, you know, a pound of nitrogen per year in Maryland, you have to do, you know, 0.9 um, for that. But if you do a little bit at a time, you have less leaching, less runoff, and the plant has a chance to take it up. 100% um, organic fertilizers actually need microbes to break them down. So that's why generally you're going to, you would like synthetic um, nutrients in there to help feed the feed the microbes to help break down the, the organic fertilizer to build your topsoil. Um, and then knowing your pH and then adjusting your pH. Turf, you know, turf likes pH of 6.8 to 7. And you can see in that chart right there, it's kind of small, but you can see it. That's when everything's more available in that to the turf plant. You know, that's where your availability, your nutrients are. So if you have a very low pH, it doesn't matter how much fertilizer that you're you're dumping on, even a high pH. Um, if it's not available to the plant, then it's it's wasted and you'll lose it. Um, so yeah, in Ross's book, he was talking about the rhizosphere, um, the relationship between the plants and the healthy soil. And it was it was uh, called the duff the duff between us. And then of course, right plant, right place. Um, people try really difficult, you know, really hard to get grass to grow in really hard to play grow places. My, my wife is always trying to get me to grow grass under our trees when it doesn't belong there. You know, it'd be better to have a shade garden there. 
um, and and you have more advantage to grow different plants in those areas. We're always recommending, you know, you know, we yeah, we give it a try, and then if it doesn't work out, let's reduce the lawn size and uh, get some better plants in here that are going to add more, you know, character to the landscape. And then other plants, of course, the, they would be weeds to some people, but you got to figure out what you want. Um, know what you got there also. Um, so you identify and, and it might be an annual, it might, might be an aggressive perennial or, you know, so if it's an annual, really you don't have to do much, kind of try to figure out what his life cycle is. Um, not all weeds are bad either. So, you know, even bad weeds I have written in there. So like crabgrass, if you have a crabgrass problem, it's because you have thin turf. Well, the crabgrass is going to fill in that bare spot, hold the soil, put its root down in the soil, and that whole plant dies because it's an annual. So then you, you're left with more organic matter in your soil there. So it's it's not a totally bad thing. And then you can seed in the fall. So you can help remedy the problem for next year. Um, so, you know, other plants can, you know, uh, the food for pollinators like uh, dandelions and clover, you got, you got the bees come into there. There's a lot of beneficial insects that use turf during the nighttime, like spiders, um, ground beetles, um, ground beetle, beetle larvae is, is very prevalent in turf. And then it moves out into the landscape once it grows into a beetle and then it can help, you know, be a beneficial insect there. Um, clover is good for pollinators. Um, it does capture nitrogen from the atmosphere, but the, the plant actually has to die to release the nitrogen. And yes, it, some of it dies here and there, but um, they used to actually have clover seed in, in turf grass seed for this reason, but it, it can, it can outcompete the turf sometimes. And then the clover goes away in the wintertime um, and then, you know, comes back. So it can be, it can be a hard thing to deal with sometimes, but it's good for pollinators. So if you guys have any questions, um, you can, you can e always email me um, there and then, uh, yeah, I can answer any questions now. Hey, Ross, do you have um, any recommendations for uh, what you feel is one of the best low maintenance type grasses, especially if you have an area where you won't be walking on it a whole lot, it won't see a whole lot of foot traffic? Yeah, um, we actually, and, and it sounds kind of bland, but we, we use a lot of the turf type tall fescue for a couple reasons, because we're a company that tries to stay away from using control materials. So the turf type tall fescue has endophytes in it, which is a mm -hmm. fungus within the plant, and that can help you with insect problems. So you can yeah. see like if you have grub problems or chinch bug problems, they'll actually eat right around that tall fescue. Um, it does very well that you, we could use it generally use a blend and it will do very well in the shade as long as it's maintained at a higher height. So the, the longer the grass blades you have, the more sunlight it can gather yeah. just like a solar panel. So cool. but yeah, to, turf type tall fescue in this area is what I would always recommend. So a blend a yield yeah. on a monoculture. So yeah. Yep. Good Great. Question. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Hey there, Andrea. Hi there, Steve. Um, am I ready to go? I'm going to be talking about the delights of native gardens and pollinators. Um, I'm a former Baltimore County uh, school teacher um, and then a mentor um, the last few years of my tenure with them. I, um, the best part of the training, of I became a master gardener in 2001 and it opened up so many doors for me. Um, and the doors keep opening. Um, the other thing was that I did take the Baywise training, and um, that also, oh boy, that also was very informative for me because it taught me a lot about landscaping that I did not know, and my property now is Baywise certified. So I'm going to be talking about the delights with native plants and pollinators, and these are two beauties that were from um, the property last year. Um, and I, um, I have one more left in chrysalis and I bought him in or her in the house. And um, hopefully it will emerge this or he closed sometime this week. So we'll go to the first slide. What I'm going to do is take you on a tour 
around the house. We'd been here for um, oh, a little over 20 years and mistakes galore. Um, when we bought this house, there was a beautiful oak tree in the front and I was gonna have this wildlife garden and I put in the burning bush and the penicetums and the grasses. And then I became a master gardener and found out, no, 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 no. Those are all invasive plants. So I did keep it, but I slowly have replaced everything that was in that front bed. And I will talk more about the front bed, but this is the pollinator garden in the backyard. This is at the base of a hill that goes up the street and it became what at first was gonna be a rain garden. But I was able to control the water flow by putting in a long riverbed that was about 50 feet and then the water funneled into this area but it was so controlled that the rain garden became so successful that i could turn it into a pollinator garden and this has been now about the fifth year for this garden very successful it has got tons of common milkweed that i give out to a lot of people and you see some of the plants that are in that garden very, very, um, and it borders up against the woods. So I get the morning, afternoon, and some late afternoon sun, but that's a woodland behind that um, pollinator garden has been very successful. And, um, and of course, it, it's just a magnet for bees and butterflies. Um, I have tried to put in everything in there that would attract them. Um, and there's always work to be done. I'm gonna enlarge it next year. Okay, the next slide takes us to the side of the house where two of my very, I'm only telling you some of my favorite plants. Winterberry is just a magnet for robins, but it's also a magnet for cedar waxwings. I hope they beat the robins. Um, I hope the cedar waxwings beat the robins this year, but um, it has been a draw card for them. The bottle brush just learned about that about three years ago, and this has just been an exquisite plant. I also have on the side, I don't know if you can see it, up to the right of the um, bottle brush is elderberry, which is another wonderful black lace. Um, it's lost some of its leaves right now, but red twig dogwoods, daisies, irises, none natives, but nevertheless, they're in the garden. Um, Joe pie is another one in ironweed. You can't see the Joe pie on this because it's just a small shot, but the Joe pie and um, ironweed are wonderful plants too for butterflies. And in the next slide, I'm going to be taking you to the front of the house. Now, Nine Bark was written up a few years ago in the Sun paper, and I said, Nine Bark, oh, that's a native plant. Well, I happened to be at a local store where they were selling the native. So, and I bought three of them and they have done wonderfully. The burning bushes are gone. The, and the nine bark is giving a lot of that appeal that the burning bush had. I do have blueberries in this front bed where it does get sun. The viburnums are turning beautiful colors. Um, I do have some flowers in that front bed. Again, the zinnias. Um, I'm trying to think the other one that I have is the witch hazel, which is one of my favorite uh, trees. And you can't see the fringe tree, which is in that front bed, which is another favorite tree. Um, they give appeal in the springtime and then things are just always evolving in this garden. Um, it's, I was in that front bed today, just looking at things, not cutting back, but just looking like, what changes can I make? Are there any new um, native plants that I can put in here? But do I have some that are not native? Yes. I have uh, some of the Ilex cronatas, which are a nice shrub, but I just removed four of them because I wanna put in a um, another type of garden in the front, an herb garden, which I've started. So again, there it's constantly evolving with, with each season, you think of something else or you read of something else. So it's not static. It never has been. And I suspect if I look at this five years from now, it'll again look very different. And our next slide, ah, this is my janky delight. 
I'm, I really identified with chapter 69 of Ross's book um, because I too am one of those people. If I see some something out that's garbage in somebody's front yard, I have been known to pick up wicker chairs and all kinds of things to put them in the garden because they just add something. This old wheelbarrow had a flat tire and rusted out. I spray painted it my favorite color. And it was a seasonal delight for me with the fall arrangements that I would put in, summer arrangements, even holiday arrangements. It has bit the dust and something else is now in its place, which isn't exactly a janky because I bought it. But um, there are some things that you just can't resist when you see them. But that has, uh, that's been probably my favorite and I do miss it. Uh, going on to the next slide, Amsonia, it, I, people stop when they're walking their dogs to ask about this plant because it's drama is yet to unfold. It The golden color is what it will turn into after the first frost. Now, of course, we haven't had that yet, but I'm looking forward to it. And it just stays gorgeous all summer long. It is probably my favorite um, perennial, small shrub. I don't know, but whatever it is, I love having it in the garden. I am going to be giving some cuttings of this. I can dig up some of this to share with other people because that's what you do with your plants that you love so much. And if they like it, I need to give them some. Our next slide is the mailbox. This is a changing seasonal garden. In early spring, it will have everything from daffodils, different kinds of daffodils, um, anything that's flowering, um, irises, and then it's just constantly evolving. Now, my favorite plant there is the turtle head on the left, which is the checker spot host plant, um, what it needs. So that is another plant that is um, very desirable. In the back, you can't see it, but there's the Baptisia or blue false indigo, another beautiful plant that is very appealing in the garden. Okay, our next slide is the side bed where um, my neighbor had a number of huge white pines. You can imagine how big they got in about 25 years. Well, those white pines were, there was no grass that could grow under them. And they were not suited to houses that were only maybe 60 to 75 feet apart. They were just dominating not only her landscaping, but my landscaping. And she realized it and she was only too happy to take them down. And now we have um, in there some really great plants, gray owl juniper, a lot of appeal, native plant. Uh, the coral bark maple and viburnums. I didn't give you all the names of the viburnums. There are so many of them, but they are wonderful plants. Also, there is um, the Joe Pine ironweed, which you can't see in this um, goldenrod, um, which right now, well, it's just about finished. And I do have some hostas on the side that is shady. There are holly bushes. There is... Um, the holly bushes, and I'm trying to think of some of the others. Oh, spice bush. In the wooded area, there's a lot of spice bush. And um, this area has only about three years old. And you can see how well it's done because of the acidic soil that existed because of all the pine needles that were in that area from the white pines. This garden has been, is going to probably need a little bit of work because it's getting a little bit out of hand. I've tried to locate some smaller plants in it, but um, everything has gotten so dense because the soil is so rich for um, what is growing. Our next slide is the backyard. And you can see, now this slide is a couple of years old, but the backyard backs up to the woods and um, I have a moonlight garden there, which was a dream that I always had to have a white, silver and black plants. Um, it is amazing what white plants do to a dark area at night. 
that Shasta viburnum is like having a spotlight in the back. And when the Kusa dogwood, and they're kind of blooming almost simultaneously, it's incredible. I mean, you can just sit, sit outside or sit on the porch and just watch all of this. It's, it's lovely. The Mazu's Reptens is a low growing ground cover that is white. And I also have a purple one. And then everything in this bed is, in, as I said, in the whites, silvers, um, and um, blacks. The black mondo grass is, again, not native, but it, it's perfect for where it is right now. Um, the other plants that, that are not so much, I haven't pictured them, but um, getting rid of all of the invasives in the woods has enabled us to see some of the may apples. Jack and the pulpits are everywhere. No, there's no more multiflora rose. And if it's there, it doesn't last very long. Garlic mustard is still being pulled out. And um, the ivy is still growing in some areas. But if I see it, it's yanked. Um, and Mother Nature is busy at work. And it's a Halloween costume that's gotten a lot of use. Our last slide are some of the resources that I highly recommend um, that one all the way to the right, native plants for wildlife habitat and conservation landscaping. This is by far the Bible for native landscaping. Um, there are a lot of things that are now coming out with the emphasis on monarchs, a lot of plants and a lot of materials, monarch watch, um, you can even become part of that uh, Monarch Watch. And um, I, I highly recommend you looking into even the Xerces Society for um, invertebrate and how to promote invertebrates uh, on your property. All of these resources are, I think, wonderful for if you really get into this. And the more you read, the more you learn, the more you want to get those natives and those um, pollinating plants in your garden. And I think, was that the last slide? Oh, this is it. Okay. Um, this is not a picture from my garden, but I thought it was lovely because some of them are native, some of them are not. Um, the one that I, I can't help but go to is the turtle head, which is on the right-hand side, the one right in the middle. But uh, the, you have to remember not to use the pesticides. I was talking to someone today who was really upset with the um, some of the invasives in her woods and she was spraying. And I said, you know, some of those vines like um, the Oriental Bittersweet with its telltale orange root that my plant, I pulled out three of them today in my front bed. They were only about four inches tall, but that orange root. Now, if it was a bigger vine going up the tree, I would cut that vine and not spray the plant. I would paint the root where I cut it or the, the trunk where I cut it. And I told her that I said, just keep a sponge brush, paint it with whatever you're using, and then keep that just for that plant. So you're not pouring or spraying any of the chemical on it. Because really, to be very honest with you, with a well-planted or uh, oriental bittersweet, you can't pull it out. I mean, catching it when it's small, yes. Take a soil sample as was previously discussed. Do your research because sometimes, as I said, a little learning is a dangerous thing, but it's also a good thing. In my case, it made me realize the mistakes that I made in, in the home that I we had just purchased and it took a while to correct some of that. Um, plant according to sun and shade and all the conditions that are mentioned in that um, brochure that I had told you about earlier and use compost whenever you can. Um, for people that have been composting for years, I, I just think it's the greatest thing you can do to decrease your garbage and um, whether you do it in a compost bin or whether you just uh, have another way to do it, it's, it's important that you do that. Just remember, a garden is a work in progress. It changes just like we change. Just be patient and, um, and, and you will be successful. Um, are there any questions?
Yeah. Oh, how do you propagate milkweed? Um, well, Ross, <laughs> your address, I will mail you some seeds. You'll just <laughs> well, I can always get the seeds, but I can never get it to pop up. I don't know what the deal is. Okay. Um what do you do with the seeds when you get them? I usually put them in the refrigerator over the winter. Oh, so you do stratify them. Mm -hmm. um, well, I uh, do you, when you get the seeds, I would just put them right outside where you want them to be. Gotcha. Don't put them in the refrigerator. Put them right outside because right now I have too much milkweed. Is that <laughs> possible? Uh, yeah. I have too much of it. And so yeah. I'm going to have to kind of like, take the pods that are dropping now and I'm going to have to place them in other places. So I will go gotcha. wandering down by my community pond. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go wherever I can spread it like Johnny Appleseed. Yep. There you go. Sounds good. Uh, yes, it is a carex in the flower pot. I okay. love that. I love that. Yeah. That's a good and point. Yeah. I, I just love that. And I will save that over. I will bring mm -hmm. it into the garage and I'll save that. I have a lot of native carrots in my woods here. Yeah. So. Um, any other questions? The bittersweet, if you pull it the way the root goes into the ground, if you pull it the direction the root is going, it'll pop right out. Yeah. So. Well, I noticed the one that was about three or four inches today, I got the whole thing and I mm -hmm. said, yes. Yeah. If you pull in that direction that the root yeah. is growing, it'll, okay, it'll thank come you. right on out. So. Thank you. Okay, I uh, I think we've got all the questions, and uh, this was a, a wonderful, wonderful presentation, and such a wide range of um, learning about uh, gardening and uh, our backyards and so on. Um, I'd like to uh, just take a moment again to thank all of our sponsors and uh, to thank everybody who was able to attend this evening, and but especially to thank our presenters. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Dorothy, thank you, but really uh, you should get a ton of thanks for helping yeah. coordinate this and hold our hands and Absolutely. make sure that we got all the technology working right, because without you, it would have looked like you know what. So you, you did a great job and a hats off to you. Well, thank you. Uh, library just really appreciates uh, bringing in your, your knowledge and experience and expertise. And uh, uh, so happy gardening, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. And I owe you an Amsonia, Dorothy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I haven't forgotten. <laughs> that would be great. That would be great. Well, thank you all again. Great. Thank you. Thank you.